Good evening. For those of us here tonight that are 70 years old or younger, Jack Cardiff was shooting film before we were born. I don't do many interviews, but when I was invited to speak about Jack Cardiff, my friend, I couldn't resist. Because Jack Cardiff is an amazing guy. Every time I saw certain names, and one of the names kept popping up was uh, Cardiff. Every time I saw these names, I knew I was in for something very, very special. And I, I, I began to... Um, have a very strong affinity towards British cinema because of, because of my recognition of Cardiff's name, actually. The way a movie is photographed creates a mood and creates the mood of the whole movie so that the audience is prepared for the kind of movie it's going to be. Cinematography is central to film. The motion, motion pictures is, is the art form of the 20th century and you can't do them without the cameraman. Going over to Bogey, he's dead, she's dead, she's dead, she's dead, she's alive. I'm just alive. It's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> you've, you've outlived them all. Yeah. Incredible. I don't know. Do you think it's a tragic industry to be in sometimes? No, I don't think so. I think it's a, it's a, it's a nonsensical thing to be yeah. a job to be in because it's full of... Um, full of um, hypocrisy, hyperbole, <laughs> just about everything you can think of. Everybody said, who is that guy? Because I don't think anybody really knows who I am. I say, well, I used to be a stand-in for Frank Sinatra. How did that <laughs> uh, Jack Cardiff a été uh, un des plus grands uh, chefs opérateurs uh, de la couleur. C'est certainement un, un, des, un des grands innovateurs uh, de la couleur au cinéma. I'll come up a bit on this one. And they're, they're putting on a narrow one on the yeah. number four. Am I cheeky to ask, how old are you now, Jack? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was 91. You're still working? Yes, well, not for long. I 
Another ten years, and I'll have to take it easy. I think. Can you put this color on now? Yes, sir. Where you are now with the smoke? That's it. When did you begin, Jack? In this business. Uh, well, I started in nineteen. Uh, 1918 um, as a kid actor. That's a long way back, isn't it? And th that's myself when I was about five years of age. You'd already been in a movie at this point, hadn't you? Yes, I had. Do you remember, uh, as a child, the first film you acted in? Very, very, very fuzzily. I know that uh, it was called My Son, My Son. I was four years of age, and um, it was a silent picture, of course. The director used to shout the instructions through the megaphone, you know, now smile a bit, look over to her, you love her, come on now, you do this, and that was, that was easy, you know. In between stage shows, my mother and father would work as extras sometimes. The standard rate of pay in those days, the extras got one guinea a day. And um, there was something like, I don't know, 150 or 200 extras. And they were paid at the end of the day by filing past a little booth. After a while, they realized what they could do. They'd get to the end of the queue and they'd change hats or put on a different hat and a different coat and they'd go by and they'd take another guinea. And they were making a fortune until they were found out. <laughs> Just the queue was filing by for hours collecting guineas. I had a different home every week. I went to about 300 schools in my youth and learned practically nothing. So where, where did you pick up all your skills? I read a pornographic book by Frank Harris but uh, in between the porn, there was all these great names he mentioned he'd met, you know, all these great writers and painters and musicians. And I went out to Foyles and bought all the books he mentioned in his book. And I read the lot. And that started it, and I kept on reading ever since. So you learned in between bits of pornography? Yes. The first job I had was really a kind of runner boy. I was. The, the director had some kind of flatulence problem and he, he was, um, he had to be given vichy water and I had to hand him fresh, cold vichy water at any time of the day, so I had to sort of have it all ready. And that was a silent picture. And uh, then the next picture was uh, the beginning of sound. Hitchcock was in the next stage. When sound films first came out, they had to be obviously synchronized. And uh, to do that, we had clappers, which was just two pieces of wood that did that. And then you'd, you'd put the sound against the picture as it closed. Uh, and the first clappers, they thought it was such an important function that they gave it to the director. And he would solemnly announce the scene and then clap and sit down and say, action, this was considered a very vital thing. But after a while, it was, he thought it was a bit of a bore doing that, so they, they put the job with the uh, young clapper boy, the, as he was called. He was a number boy, and he became a clapper boy. And I used, to, I used to do that. Four, take one. While I was at B&D Studios, I was working on uh, British quota pictures, which had to be completed in uh, two to three weeks. I was then operating the camera, and you couldn't make any mistakes because they'd never do another take. There wasn't time, there wasn't money. Corda brought over a, a lot of um, very good people and I'm, I think was instrumental um, in founding the sort of British school, if you like. I mean, he gave people the opportunity to, to learn from masters of their craft. Run. Run, Orlando. A lot of fascinating stars were coming over and big directors. And uh, what was most important, very good uh, top Hollywood cameramen. What 
are you waiting for? Dietrich was a big sensation, of course, and uh, she, she used to put gold dust in her hair. She knew a lot about lighting, because she'd worked with Joseph von Sternberg. She would have been a great cameraman. And uh, she knew that that lighting had to be so high, 45 degrees, to make a shadow under the nose. And most cameramen over the years have done exactly the same sort of lighting. She had a slightly turned up nose, like Marilyn Monroe, in fact. And so to straighten it out, she had this white line down here. And then inside here, inside the eyes, she put this white, see this white inside. It must have been painful to do this. Mm -hmm. But she looked gorgeous, but she was in command of the lighting. And she used to have a full length mirror by the side of the camera. And she'd look in the mirror and say, Harry, I think the backlight would get a bit hotter, you know. And, and how about the kicker light? Do you think that's a little out? And she used to comment on it. And Harry would whisper in me, God damn it, she's always right. You had luck, Silver. Wonderful luck. And the most wonderful of all is to meet you. Do you think so? Yes, I do think so. Even if tomorrow means the end of us. As it may do. What about this one? Well, we had this scene in the bath and uh, she, she came on the set, and uh, we thought she got, was going to be in a swimming costume, which was the usual thing. And when she took off her dressing gown, she was stark naked. Within about half an hour of doing all these shots in the bath, the place was crowded. There was about 16 electricians on the spot rail, look, trying to look technical, holding lamps and things. The, the ground, which was a paper floor, was getting wetter and wetter, and as she got out, she slipped on the soapy water and fell with a crash and the towels missed, it, missed her completely, east and west in the air. And she, there was the great Marlena floundering about on the floor, stark naked. He started very early in color. Uh, started about when they started doing color, I believe. That's right. And it's a different medium, really. You, you light in a different way, which of course is the, the cameraman. Technicolor people had come over to choose one young operator to be trained in Technicolor. They came out shaking because the technical questions were absolutely very, very tough. So when it came to my turn, I said right away, well, I'm afraid on the technical side, I'm absolutely zero. And there's a shock silence. And they said, well, how do you, how do you think you're going to get on in the film business? And I said, well, I study painting and light and light in buildings and so on. And they asked me which side of the face did Rembrandt light. I took a chance on that one and said this side, and of course it would be reversed in an etching. And then I talked about Peter de Hook and his interiors and the camera obscura and that stuff. And uh, the next day I learned that I had been chosen. Light comes through the front, obviously through the lens, and there's a prism here, which is a very, this is the soul of the Technicolor camera. 25% of the light comes straight through the prism onto the one film in this gate here. That's the green record. And then the other rest of the light, 75% of the light, comes through and is reflected onto a bipack. This is a bipack of the red and the blue records. And of course, the magazine holds three films. Of course, these things free, free the sprockets. They do nothing except that. But I used to put on this bay act and say, I think I'll put a bit more green here, a little less uh, blue there. <laughs> And they believed it. They thought I was creating color with the camera. It's terrific stuff. The whole camera department were American, and uh, Jack was the only one on the camera crew who was English. And he was the camera operator on it at Denham. Second now, knocked down Destiny, here they come. Knocked down well in front of Destiny Bay. Down the hill, still in rather a pocket on winds of the morning. It was a fascinating new world because I, I was into the Impressionists at that time, and I was mad about the Impressionist painters. And I thought, well, this is it. <laughs> The surface of anything you look at is absorbing some colour rays and is reflecting the rest. What it reflects strikes the eye, and that's how we get our impression of colour. Colour is light, and light is colour. You always like to experiment, and you like to 
apply certain things which he felt he'd learnt from painting to cinematography. Well, as you see, I, I always collected a lot of interesting paintings and drawings. I learned a lot about painting. Well, I'm still learning, let's face it. Uh, and um, the, the main idea is I copied some painters. I, I liked that Boucher. Mm -hmm. I couldn't afford to buy the real one. And so I copied it, and uh, that's the way to learn. A lot of real painters copy other painters, you mm -hmm. know, because this way they learn from each other in a way. It's a very interesting thing. Some people say, oh, it's a copy. Yes, it's a copy, but it takes a long time to analyze the painting to make the copy. Then I had a big break because um, a, a, a German came in to Technicolor, who was a, a Count, Count von Keller. And he was a great traveler. He was a sort of, um, I don't know, you know, sort of buccaneer almost. He was a wonderful character, really. And, and somebody suggested to him, when you're on these travels, why don't you um, make films? Why don't you take along a Technicolor camera and crew and make travel films? The work and spirit of the immortal Lawrence live to this day. For Lawrence, in his quiet, unobtrusive way, imparted to the dwellers of this wild territory a sense of law and order of which they had never dreamed. Jack is in the middle and I'm on the right. That's in Palmyra in Syria. We went to Africa and India and all over the world with the Technicolor camera. The outside walls are richly carved with incidents from Hindu legend. So rich that not one panel resembles any other. Most people hadn't been abroad, I mean, and to see places in colour was, was marvellous. He is Nandi the Bull, Nandi the Joyous, worshipped as an embodiment of the force of reproduction. But Jack really was the creative drive behind them. I mean, nobody else had much idea about how to set about making it original and different. Vesuvius. When Vesuvius was on and there were splotches of, of molten lava falling, we had to sort of choose a moment to dash in and just point the camera. While from the lips of its many gaping mouths, the lava... I broke the prism and uh, burnt the tripod legs. Burnt my shoes anyway, but that's just another story. Western Approaches is an extraordinary film because it's it's the first ever Technicolor documentary, really, uh, that isn't a travelogue. What have you decided to do, sir? Make for Ireland. The bailing winds and part of the Gulf Stream should be in our favour. We had a, a lifeboat with 22 merchant seamen in it. And the Technicolor camera was very clumsy, very difficult to work. And the director and myself and a few assistants and so on. And we went out every day on the Irish Channel, which was absolutely horrible. This is the Forces program. Now here's a short recital of gramophone records. We're on the home stretch now, Bill. You can always tell when you hear the old BBC. Don't belong now. For the first time in living memory, British filmmakers had a British audience. People really enjoyed seeing British films. They actually preferred them in some cases to American films. They felt they came from you know, closer to the scene of the action. How could Americans understand what people in Britain were going through during the war? And so, towards the end of the war, I think British filmmaking was really on a high. At that time, I had not yet photographed a feature film in its entirety. I'd done lots of little pieces, and I'd worked mostly on the second unit and I was desperate to get the big break. There was a wonderful sequence in which uh, the main character played by Roger Livesey is trying to deal with his loneliness by going on uh, safaris and shooting animals all over the world. And Jack Cardiff was doing the shooting of that uh, as a second unit cameraman. And uh, my husband came in and watched him doing it. And I heard a voice say, very interesting, and looked round, and there was the great Michael Powell, and he said, would you like to photograph my next film? And I said, oh, yes, Mr. Powell. And I, he went, and I thought, well, he's just said that, and he'll forget all about it, but he didn't. Are you wounded? Repeat, are you wounded? Are you bailing out? What's your name? 
June. Yes, June, I'm bailing out. I'm bailing out, but there's a catch. I've got no parachute. Hello, hello, Peter, do not understand. Hello, hello, Peter, can you hear me? Michael Pollock just felt that Jack was the man at that time who knew the most about how to get uh, color onto film in a new way. The Archers had what was described as the longest period of subversive filmmaking within a major studio ever. And because their films were very popular, uh, commercially successful, they got away with murder. We were our own bosses. We produced it, we wrote it, we directed it. And if anybody said to us, may I suggest you do this, we just said, therefore. It was a wonderful combination because you had Michael, who was uh, daring and running around and doing outlandish things, and Emmerich, who was a brilliant writer anyway, he would be the, the one who occasionally would say to Michael, well, I think this is going too far because of this or that, and he'd usually be right. A fantastic, fertile, imaginative mind, a very unique person in his own way, uh, and then you add Jack to the mix, you have a pretty powerful cocktail. It was daunting for me as my first film, and, and even for Michael Powell, it was uh, an ambitious project. We were on doing an exterior, and Michael said, Oh, he said, I'd love to have a fade in, a kind of, instead of just a fade in, I'd like to have some, something different, it's like a mist thing or something. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, look through the camera. So he looked through the camera, and I went to the lens and went, <sighs> Every time I saw the Arches logo, I knew I was in for something special. Then I saw the name Cardiff, Cardiff attached with that. And I knew that this was a very, very uh, unique, uh, uh, I was about to undergo a very, very unique experience. Child, where were you born? In Boston, sir. I'd made a bunch of films in, in Hollywood, but nothing to compare with this. It was an enormous production. The court will adjourn. It was, I've always thought, um, as pure cinema as Disney, really. I mean, it, you couldn't do it on the stage or in any other way. I remember in the first preparation days of the film, I said to him quite casually, I said, Michael, I suppose heaven will be in colour and the earth will be in black and white. He said, no, the contrary. And I said, why? He said, because everyone expects that. And that was typical in his nature. He was perverse to the extent that he would like to do anything that was different. I mean, the ordinary was anathema to him. A little trick of mine, you remember? In order to get the transition from, from black and white to color, we would shoot the main sequence in black and white. But the, the penultimate shot was using the Technicolor camera so that they would be able to start in black and white and then bring in the color. Marius Goring ad-libbed a line during one of the scenes and Mickey Powell immediately said, keep it in, good line. <laughs> when he's starved for Technicolor up there. Really, throughout all of my life, I do not go to dailies, except that when we were doing A Matter of Life and Death, I was so curious that I did go early on, I think for the first time that, that the, um, uh, they had color in the dailies. They clearly were not happy with uh, the color. They said, send it back and uh, do better than that. We must have it better than that. So I have a feeling that Jack was very much behind all of that. Outside the Empire, thousands of Londoners crowding the approaches to see the royal family and also the many film stars and notabilities attending the Royal Command film performance. Michael Powell, one of the two producers of the film, on the stairway. At the end of the picture, either the cameraman would collect these, put on one sheet, or Technicolor would do it for him. I have several, and they're great fun to look at them. is 8,000 feet up. 
peaks on the range opposite are nearly as high as Everest. The people call the highest peak Nanga Devi. It means the bear goddess. On Black Narcissus, we all expected to go on location to India. And we were greatly surprised when Michael Powell, the director, told us the entire film was going to be made at Pinewood Studios in England. I saw it as a wonderful exercise for all, for all of us to produce a, a real perfect colour work of art. Michael collected around him the best technicians that were available and he had a brilliant art director, Alfred Junger. He was very German and, and highly organised and if he designed a set, there, when you walked on for the first time, there would be a cross on the floor and he said that is the camera position with the 35mm lens. Uh, Alfred Junger, the designer, and uh, Jack Cardiff, the cameraman, would have endless arguments and conversations about the settings. First of all on paper and then, then when they were painted, then in detail and then when the set was there. The exteriors out on the lot at, at Pinewood with the Himalayas and everything, I mean, were absolutely marvellous because they were plaster mountains in perspective. But, I mean, the result was just unbelievable. You actually looked out of the window and it looked real. Sometimes Alfred would have to tear half of it down. Jack pointed out that the kind of lighting that he wanted for this particular sequence couldn't be done because there was a wall in the way. Alfred would be furious, but, but together they just worked miracles. I mean, you never get the slightest feeling of studio, do you? After the film was released, I believe Mickey got a letter from someone in India who said that they knew the locations, they'd seen them. <laughs> it was a good, good idea. Vermeer was the sort of painter I had in mind on Black Narcissus because the, the light had to be clear and uh, as simple as possible. When I did this, this green, having green filters in the filler light and um, sort of pinkish colors in the, in the sun effects, it was a, a thing of anger. I tried to use the same kind of mood in that, that, I mean, any, any cameraman would get ideas from Van Gogh and moods of light and things. Light is the principal agent, and um, that should be the same with photography, that the use of light, like a painter, that you use it in a simple form. The same kind of emotional and psychological connection that was made through certain lighting and paintings uh, I felt watching those pictures that he photographed. He, he made them special. Because of that, you wanted to be in that world with them. You can't order me about. You have nothing to do with me anymore. I know what you've done. I know that you've left the order. I only want to stop you from doing something you'll be sorry for. Sister Philippa is going back in a few days' time. I want to send you with her. That's what you would like to do. Send me back. <laughs> and shut me up. I think Michael Powell felt color was very much part of the narrative. Sister Cloda, Sister Cloda! Do you know what she says about you? Well, whatever she said, it was true. You said that because you love her! I don't love anyone! Cloda. 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 When I saw their work on screen, this was like being bathed in color. It was palpable. It was, it, I don't know what it, it Color, the color itself became the emotion of the picture. The atmosphere that was created around me was, was fantastic. I was most, most inspired by it. I mean, I thought I was just going out looking a bit malevolent. But um, when I saw it on the screen, uh, I was amazed at this great blare of music and this incredible face with the wet hair. He gave me half of my performance with the lighting. When Arthur rang, and he took it to California, showed it in Hollywood, 
They got the most wonderful technical praise. You know, the art direction got two Oscars. Jack Carter's photography got another Oscar. The whole communication of the film, what the film is trying to communicate, is combined through uh, costume, positioning of people in the frame, um, movement of people within the frame, sometimes movement of the frame itself, uh, light, shadow, color, and cutting, all to music. All designed specifically to music. And then they did this, they took it, of course, and they went further with it with the Red Shoes Ballet. The last day but one of Black Narcissus, Michael Powell said to me, what do you think about ballet, Jack? And I said, not much. I said, all these sissies prancing about, you know, and I said, I don't think much of it. And he, he was amused rather than horrified. He said, well, Jack, you better better get to like ballet because this is your next film. And he said, and I've got tickets for it to go to it practically every night. And I thought, oh my God. And very shortly, of course, I became absolutely wrapped up in ballet and I loved it. Actually, Miss Page, I want more, much more. I want to create, to make something big out of something little. The theme of the Red Shoes, of course, is that um, what Michael was trying to say is that if you want to be on the cutting edge of your art form, you have to be prepared to pay the consequences for it because uh, you're challenging everybody when you start breaking conventions. And you have to be aware that, that some people may be able to attack you and bring you down when you do this. Why do you want to dance? Why do you want to live? Well, I don't know exactly why, but uh, I must. That's my answer, too. Some, some ballet enthusiasts feel that uh, it's not the best shooting a ballet. Well, the best shooting a ballet, I guess, if you want to be literal about it, would be from head to toe. The way Fred Astaire had in his contract that you have to keep photographing him head to toe. But what they did was they changed that completely. Uh, they paid no attention to that. And what they did was they made a film about what goes on inside the, the, the dancer's head. It's how the dancer, he or she, sees themselves while they're dancing, as they're dancing. So you get the spirit of the dance. You get the spirit of it. And uh, well, that I applied that later to uh, the boxing scenes in Raging Bull. Uh, what they hear, what they see. What they hear and what they see. Very important. Michael Powell had courage. He would risk, he would take a risk, a big chance to do something which might seem crazy, but it usually came off. The, the camera devices are welded to the material. They're welded to the emotion of the film. They are for the purpose of impacting the audience. I think because Jack um, had vision, you know, a, a, about what he was going to do, he didn't feel curbed by the restrictions of that time. Well, I had the idea of, of, of increasing the speed of the camera very rapidly, that as he jumped, I went from 24 frames to 48 frames for about less than a second. So it went up, and as he got up, it was going much faster, which slowed him down imperceptibly, and he seemed to linger in the air on the top of the jump. You can see that they had, con they were constantly coming up with great ways to use the camera, and when you see how big that thing was, how they did it, I don't know. I mean, they did call it the Enchanted Cottage because it was so huge, and uh, how they moved that thing around, I don't know. It was amazing. Can you imagine? It was changed. enormous, and you didn't have much room to get lights around it, you know. And that's a famous Technicolor camera, Jack, me, with a camera flying in and out as so from the viewpoint of a dancer. Would have been a handheld shot these days, but I mean, the camera is on a, a sort of bungee slung from a chain in the roof. you begin to see, I must say, flourishes with a camera, a cut, or a piece of composition for the length of the shot, uh, that you begin to realize uh, 
uh, that he's using um, the lens like a, a brush strokes. It becomes like moving paintings, you know, it's a painting he's made. Along with Hein Heckroth, along with Michael and then Emmett Pressburger, there's no doubt. But it's a painting, paintings that moved, extraordinarily moved, not only moved um, uh, visually, but, uh, but emotionally um, and, and psychology, uh, psychologically also. <laughs> There was something so audacious about Red Shoes and something that was so utterly um, uh, unique, different from any film being made at the time. The lessons of, the, of those films have never left me. I still keep drawing upon them. I think it's had a huge influence, I mean, particularly on Scorsese, of course, and Brian De Palma. De Palma, De Palma, easily, the expressionism. It's about expressing color. It's expressing, uh, the, you know, the, the glint of a knife and the color of the blood. I mean, it's, it's all there with Brian. Look at Scarface. And uh, Lucas and uh, Coppola. And then, of course, you have Francis all the, all the time, Godfather, uh, the, clearly in One from the Heart. Uh, it's about passion, I think. You could feel these people were really, really dedicated and involved. When it was cut, it was shown to Mr. Rank. Usually, if a film isn't very good, you know, they might sort of put on a little bit of an act and say, most interesting, and, you know, and, and say, well, well done or something, and walk out. But on this occasion, they walked out, they got up, and they walked out without saying a word to Michael Powell. They just ignored him, just walked straight out because they were convinced that it was a disastrous film. J. Arthur Rank thought they'd gone mad and said, this is terrible, we have to stop this kind of filmmaking. From now on, we will tell them what to make. And Michael said, no, you won't. It was a very sad end to a great, great period of filmmaking. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, they're seminal films, you know, I mean, with regard, but they're a particular aesthetic. It, it's a kind of aesthetic that actually will be, it's great art, and then it will be kitsch. Yeah. And then it will be art again. I have signed all over England and America too. And uh, I just lost count. Happy happy birthday, huh? Yeah, that's very very great. I remember outside the studio at Gates once I just just come back from seeing Marilyn Monroe and Lawrence Olivier, and as they came through the gates, they were all screaming, you know, and then I went by and they said, who's that? And somebody said, oh, he's just nobody. <laughs> so that, How did you feel? Well, <laughs> just like a nobody. Well, after working with Palmer and Pressburger, Jack had a, a remarkable career, really, because in quite a short space of time, in less than 10 years, he worked with many of the, the greatest filmmakers in the world. I mean, it's a real roll call that starts with Hitchcock. Hitchcock had just made Rope. It was 80 minutes, it was supposedly one take. A lot of eight minute and ten, nine minute takes put together so that the picture appeared to be in, in actual time. And I think Hitch was in love with this idea because he felt a certain technical satisfaction. Ingrid Bergman, she is alleged to have said, you know, you care more about the technicalities than you do about the acting. He, he put everything in the preparation of the picture. He very rarely looked through the camera because he knew what the camera was getting. So he said to me, Jack, you've got the 35 lens on, yes, and you're just getting the hands in the picture, yes. He knew what he was getting. It was the first crane of its kind that ran entirely independent of tracks. The camera started in the front of the house, through the kitchen, and then into the drawing room. Talk, talk, talk. Went into the hall. Parts of the set would have to slide open to allow the camera crane to go through. We'd pan round to where the walls had been closed. I had to light six or eight sets more dozens of different positions, round and round, 
back to the hall. All in one shot without the camera stopping. I had electricians holding lamps and dodging under a table and coming out. On one occasion, uh, we'd had a shot where we had to go upstairs and through the door. And as we approached her bed, we went into a big close-up. When instead of sort of going up, looking down on the bed like that, which was a cumbersome thing to do, we approached a straight, and the bed was on electronic things. And as you as you tracked in, the bed would come up like this, so that you'd have a big close-up without the camera going too high. It ended up by not being ten-minute takes. There were some very long takes, but it became impractical to do. It couldn't possibly be wonderful photography because it was a everything was a compromise but it was really my greatest achievement in a funny way because uh, I, I it was doing the impossible i'm just going outside i may be away some time It was probably uh, one of the most marvellous pictures that I've ever been on. And uh, I had the luck of having a fantastic cameraman. There was something very, very special and unique about the English use of Technicolor particularly uh, by a man like, uh, like Cardiff. And that became something else, and that had a lot to do with emotion, I think. It had more to do with painting. Not to say that the, that the American uh, cinematographers didn't use painting. Of course, they were, they were brilliant. Uh, but, um, how should I put it? That was a, a different type of commodity. Jack joined Hollywood at the point at which it really began to march out into the world. I think that was a very exciting moment for a cinematographer to be working with those Hollywood filmmakers. He worked with Henry Hathaway. Well, he was a toughie. He really was a toughie. On the Black Rose, he um, fired so many people that um, we had a plane called the Hathaway Special, which used to fly people every couple of days that had been fired back to England. I mean, he would devote his life to that picture. He would die for that picture, you know. And he expected everyone else to die for the picture. And if they were, they were not ready to die, he would uh, just crucify them. I never saw anyone look less like young gallants going off on a great adventure. He said he'd play Gungus Khan on condition that his, his coat was lined inside with mink. They said, but Orson, you know, we don't see the mink coat, it's expensive. They said, Orson said, I've got to do it that way. So, okay, so they got the mink and they put it in line. You never saw it inside, lining inside. And of course, at the end of the film, when his part was finished, he slipped off with the coat and went off to do uh, more scenes on Othello and turned the coat inside out so that he had the mink coat for Othello. What are you stewing about, Mon Capitan? Barnard told you where we were going last night. Where? The Sahara Desert. Straight ahead and turn to your left. On the first day of shooting, when John Wayne, he played the part of um, a foreign legionnaire. He came on the set and he had, he had a cowboy hat on and uh, the holster and the boots and the gun, and just like a cowboy. And I said to Hathaway, Henry, why is he wearing that cowboy outfit? And Hathaway looked at me like I was an idiot. He said, he always wears the cowboy outfit. <laughs> he was always doing the, 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 withdrawing the gun business, you know, and flicking it around and flicking it back again. He was always doing it. And I did a lot of shots of him doing that. And someone gave Sophia one of these things you blow and it comes out, you know. She loved that. Hathaway was a wonderful director, and he was, but he was a man who, in a sense, bulldozed him his way along. He had got far worse when, on that picture because we had this desert which had to be virgin desert, you know, no sign of a, a footprint or anything. And you can imagine a film unit walking about. And he was going crazy. The English 
English crew were having a cup of tea in this so-called place. And uh, he put up a notice on the board because he hated the whole idea of the English unit having tea. And he said, in future, on the notice board, the English crew will drink their tea standing up. And he said, come on, Jack, we get these locations. Let's find these locations. So I got in the car and I said, Henry, you've just blown it. You've made a terrible mistake. He said, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, well, at the moment, the English crew, they respect you. They don't particularly like you, but they respect you. But I said, now you've done that. I said, English tea. I said, forget it. I said, you're a, you're a villain from now on. He said, oh, you're full of shit. You know, and he just thought for a moment. And he turned the car around and drove back and he tore the notice board off the, off the screen. <laughs> I've got something for you too, and it's my heart, black as it is, but all of it. The assistant director had come on the set and said, Flynn's arrived. He said he's just gone straight to the bar and he's drinking double whiskers followed by beer chasers. So when I got to the bar and I was introduced to him, he was never really drunk. He was always sort of slightly, sort of pleasantly drunk. Errol fell ill halfway through, crossed swords, and he collapsed and was taken to hospital. And the doctor said, well, I'm afraid we think he's dying. His liver doesn't exist anymore. He has no liver. And the producer said, you don't understand. We're making a movie. <laughs> we carried on shooting with a double. We did mostly Gina stuff. And, and in uh, something like three or four weeks, he came on the set. And he did look pretty awful, but he had survived. And the doctor said, well, it's a miracle. But of course, he was never touch a drop of drink again. And he came on the set with a glass that much neat vodka. And as you carried on as usual. You have been studying my style, monsieur. I think one has to understand at that time, films were still into, I was going to say films were still entertainment as opposed to today. No, today they're entertainment too. But at that time, they were coming out of the old Hollywood system. And there was a, you know, there were westerns, there were genre films. And a technicolor was used for heightening the genre in the 40s and 50s. Color was still relegated to films as a special element, rather than what happened in the late 60s and the early 70s, where all films became color. Jack was suggested by the producer of the picture, who also happened to be the star, and that's Kirk Douglas. The shooting was very difficult. It seemed to be raining all the time. And once, in exasperation, I asked one of the young Norwegian kids, hey, does it rain all the time here? He said, I don't know, I'm only 18 years old. I suggested to Dick, I said, why don't we shoot in the rain? Because um, these Vikings are tough guys, you know, and they, they would be out in all weathers. And of course, Dick agreed, and Kirk Douglas was overjoyed because it means that we could shoot, you know. Yeah. Wouldn't lose so much money. But of course, as people know in the film business, ordinary rain doesn't photograph, so we had to supplement it with hoses coming down and the local villagers thought we were out of our minds. It was already raining and we were adding rain to it, but it worked very well. Kirk Douglas, he liked doing his own stunts. In fact, he was a very good, uh, he had a good sense of timing and all the things that are good in a stunt man. You know, he does the shot walking on the oars. Uh, That's right. He fell in once or twice, but he soon got the hang of it. Well, that, that was considered a must that he had to fall off because he was too perfect, in fact. When he climbs up the wall of the castle, you know, after having thrown the axe, he climbed himself. With Jack's ingenuity, we were able to do some pretty remarkable shots. And looking at the film now, I'm really astounded at how well they turned out, knowing how they were made, which was really with the spit and cardboard and some rubber bands, and it worked great. Jack and I were very worried, how are we going to make this scene where you have all the Viking ships 
going into a fog bank and disappearing. And it's essential to the story that you have that scene. And Jack solved the problem with us. He said, if we could just get a patch of fog where the ships go into the patch of fog, that's all I really need. And I'll make up the rest of the fog. I'll, I'll make my own filter uh, and paint it a white filter, which we'll just put up in front of the camera and leave a square where the real fog is. And uh, that's what we did. And it's absolutely convincing. It's a fantastic shot. Every time I see it, I get a chill, knowing how it was made, but also the beauty of the shot. Jack, certainly looking at his work uh, and having worked with him, is uh, probably the greatest color photographer that ever lived. Turner. Well, I mean, he was the perfect cameraman. I mean, if he'd, if he'd been alive today, he would have been probably the best cameraman in the world. I mean, the way that he got dramatic emphasis by over, over lighting things, which mm -hmm. is, takes courage with a cameraman anyway, but he had plenty of courage, you can see that. I mean, that, that church has burnt out, but it's, it's so dramatic. I wouldn't start to dare to compare myself to what Turner did, but I mean, I learned a lot of lessons from Turner that you should be bold and you should go out and do something that's different and bold and that's, that's the whole essence of photography in a sense. Three. We want an extreme long shot with a, a wide-angle lens uh, of the duel with the snow and these two guys facing each other, long shot. But of course, long shot, we saw all the spot rails. So I had this idea of putting a piece of glass in front of the camera, big, about six feet away, I painted the glass, in other words, the same color. Then behind my shoulder, I put a little lamp that shone into the glass like a reflection of the sun. But the first attempt I made, I was using the sprayer and I overdid it and the paint was running down the glass and Dino De Laurentiis, the producer, came on the set and said, got it, what do you do, what do you do here? You know, wasting time, what do you, what do, you do? And I said, well, I'm painting the glass. He said, oh, my man, I'll tell that was there. And he, he was furious and went and walked off the stage. But later, it was a very effective shot, and uh, he was showing it to everybody. Of all the love stories France has given to the world, this is the one to live in your memory. I had a call from New York from Josh Logan. He said, Jack, I want you to photograph Fanny. Why? Oh, I loved the film. It was great fun working with uh, Maurice Chevalier and Leslie Carroll. One of the most beautifully photographed pictures of this whole canon would be Pandora and the Flying Dutchman. When do you want to marry me, Stephen? Which was produced and directed right. by Albert Lewin, who had had a big success with the picture of Dorian Gray. Pandora and the Flying Dutchman was a very unique film. It had fantasy and exotic locations. I am predisposed to that, mainly because where I came from. You know, neorealism I had right around me. <laughs> if I want to go to a movie, I wanted to see, you know, something uh, in a sense that was more fantastical. With one bloody blow, I killed all that I loved on God's earth. It was so romantic, you know? <laughs> it was so romantic, it took you to another world completely. And there was something about the way it looked, of course, which automatically put my mind Paul Pressburger. And for many years, I thought it was a Paul Pressburger film. Faith is a lie, and God himself is chaos! Silence! It had the magical quality of Ava Gardner as almost a mystical figure, a uh, mystical sexuality. Hello! I was introduced to her, and she said, Jack, I'm pleased you're going to photograph me, but... Uh, you have to watch me when I have my periods because, you know, I don't look so good. And I said, don't worry, I'll look after that. That was the first, very first thing she said to me. And Al Lewin used to do take after take, just not that he really wanted to do another take, but he just wanted to keep going so he could gaze into Ava's face. And in a way, that's true. I've changed so since I've known you. He said, I want you to go to uh, Wallace Heaton's in Bond Street and buy yourself a 16-millimeter camera. 
which I have here, and it's just about the cheapest one you can get. And I, I took it out to Africa on African Queen, and, well, I've taken it on many films. A little starboard, miss. No, no, the other way. John Houston had the idea of doing the whole thing in Africa, and uh, he said it was going to be so easy. Houston went out there, and he said he didn't like that location. It was too, too pretty. So he disappeared for a couple of weeks, and we wondered what had happened, whether he would have been eaten by crocodiles or something. But he then sent a telegram saying he'd found the perfect place in the Belgian Congo. It was right in nowhere land. I mean, it was called Beyondo, this place, and it was beyond anywhere. It was two days' jeep ride from Stanleyville. Bogie was not always thrilled with the choice of locations because if there was an impossible location to be found, John Houston was the man to find it. I was there for the whole shoot, and um, I think Jack had tremendous admiration for John. John always tried to get almost impossible shots, really difficult ones, that, and Jack always got what he wanted. Houston was quite easy going in a way, uh, but ever beneath a casual kind of attitude was the artist, was the perfectionist. He had the utmost regard for Jack, that I know, because they basically talked the same language. We were towing this raft and we had Catherine Hepburn's little place as a dressing room. I had a tiny generator my two lamps. I only had two lamps on the picture. And uh, one or two other sound department had a place. So it was a string of little boats being towed along. And of course, when we came to a corner, like a, they, they were like a row of sausages, and you could, you, they couldn't turn, so we'd crash into the bank. We could find yourself with one leg and, um, on the African Queen, on, on the boat with Katie and Bogey sitting down there, and the other leg up on the bank of a river, and you holding a boom like that over them and allowed to go in. And in those rivers were rather nasty creatures. In Uganda, on Lake Victoria, we were all sick, very, very sick. I mean, all kinds of dysentery, all kinds of vomiting, everything. Sam Spiegel, our friend and our producer, came to the location, was furious, because the movie had to shut down for three days. We got yet another doctor to look at it. He found exactly what was wrong that the, the filter, the water filter, we were on a houseboat, you see, and the filter wasn't there. So we were drinking just r river water with the droppings of hippos and crocodiles. And the only two persons who weren't sick was Bogey and, and uh, John Houston, because they never touched water, they only drank whiskey. All right, give me a hand. Close your eyes, please, Mr. Houston. Hepburn was an incredible lady. She was very strong-minded. And in some ways, she didn't want to be regarded as a frail woman. She, she wanted to be tough and uh, accepted as a, as a woman of character and courage. And she did go in the jungle, and she was a very, very brave woman. Ain't no person in their right mind ain't scared of white water. I never dreamed that any mere physical experience could be so stimulating. How's that, miss? Bogey, of course, was, uh, he put on this big act that he was a tough guy, you know. I mean, he told me at the beginning about makeup, you know. He said, Jack, he said, I see this face. It'll take me many years to get this, all these lines and crinkles in it. He said, that's the way I want it. Don't light, light me up, make me look like a goddamn fag, you know. I want to look like this, so I did it. You know, Bogey was not uh, an actor who cared much about the way he looked, but he appreciated good photography, uh, and he... He loved effective photography that worked for the story. I wrote and directed all three of the movies Maria D'Amato was in. A short, full career from start to finish. It was really a frightening film for a young person to see. Uh, I'll never forget the opening scenes in the, in the graveyard in the rain. And his color 
his use of color, particularly when they're, when, when they're in uh, Monte Carlo on, on the yacht, and she unveils, in a sense, and Emma O'Brien, all the guys just look at her. Uh, it's an extraordinary picture. The world's number one symbol of desirability on display all over the world's number one showroom with the world's number one customers wanting to buy. And nobody wrapped her up and took her home. Oh, she was gorgeous, of course. She was so good looking. I was on location with that one as well, and that, uh, yeah, but I mean, I think that Ava Gardner was certainly not hard to photograph. I mean, <laughs> Bogey may have been, but Ava was such a great beauty. The first time I met her, she was very happy uh, with Frank Sinatra. And the next time I worked with her, she, she was leaving Frank here. Something was, had gone wrong, and uh, she was taking Sonoril to sleep. And that uh, made her a bit sleepy. The eyes had to be looked after. So I was lighting her more carefully. And um, it is a fact. They, they, they rely on a cameraman very much. I think that I am pretty enough. But I would not want to be that kind of star. Pretty enough. Any woman that can use the moon for a key light. Key light? What is that? Oh, that's your own special light when the stage is all lit up. The light that shines only on you. You took a lot of portraits of actresses, didn't you, over the years? Well, yes, I, I had, um, I used to take them usually in the lunch hour and um, I only had time to do a few. Audrey Hepburn was one I did on War and Peace. She, that's a typical type of lighting of light, dark, light, dark, you see. Dark light, dark light, light. What's the name dark, of that light, again? Chiara Scuro. I tried to photograph them as many times as possible to get used to their face and study the, any, any kind of flaws and things. Janet Lee, that was on the Vikings. And then we have um, Anita Ekberg, who had a lovely face. And that was on War and Peace. They all had different qualities. I mean, Lorraine had the most gorgeous eyes, very expressive eyes. Audrey Hepburn had these very thick eyebrows, which was, she made a fashion out of that, you know, and she made a fashion out of many things. That's Sophia Loren, with a big hat. This is when I became like a, an amateur enthusiast who takes pictures. Why does he take them? He, takes, he likes to take pictures, you know. And these women were beautiful women. And you know, like you collect stamps. I collected beautiful women, photographically, of course. Marilyn was always sort of perfectly made up and uh, she had a face which was virtually perfect. She had uh, a slightly t tipped up nose, which was very attractive. And she specifically asked for you once. What, what was that? Well, that was because I was in vogue. It's uh, almost like footballers, you know, getting around. They want a certain footballer to be uh, in a certain position. They, they find out that that's the best man. They, they get them and so on. And uh, I don't know. And she asked for me, and I was very flattered. Oh, you have pretty eyebrows. The love, what a universe of joy and pain lies in that little world. Larry was, um, that was, he was supposed to be in that position, but he wanted to look through the camera to see what the shot was. He was directing, wasn't he? He was directing. He wanted to see what the shot was, so I took his position. And Marilyn put her arms around me like that. And then later on she wrote, Jack, I tell you what we'll do. And Arthur Miller, the husband, said, oh, no, you don't. So that was that. <laughs> what were you going to do? I don't know. <laughs> it was a very tough job for him because she was... Uh, she was a darling, I, I think she was a darling girl in many instances, but she, um, she had a lot of problems. Do you reverse? Just try me. And um, she would come on the set very late 
Uh, it was a tough picture to do. Between Marilyn and Olivier, who also directed, there were occasional reports of strain. We had a wonderful makeup man, Whitey, who was with her for years. When she died, there was an urgent call from New York for, he was in New York at the time, and he had to fly back because it was in the contract he had to make her up when she was dead. And the idea of making up this gorgeous creature when she was dead and putting on the lipstick and the usual thing, it was a tough break. He, he told me he had to have a couple of stiff drinks before he started. Some weeks ago, I had a celebration party celebrating my 80 years in the cinema. No matter how good the cameraman is or thinks he is, he's got to serve the director. That's absolutely important. The director has to be the one who has the responsibility for the final film. Quelles que soient ses qualités, le chef opérateur doit être au service. It became apparent uh, when we were doing the Vikings. Uh, that uh, Jack really was very interested in, in the actors and in the direction of the picture. Jack had every potential of being an excellent director. And we discussed that. And as a matter of fact, uh, I let him direct one short scene in The Vikings uh, just to see how he handled it and uh, how he felt directing a film. I worked on a couple of B pictures, and the first one, uh, the critic said in effect, that why on earth did I want to be, be a mediocre director when I'd been on top as a cameraman? And they suggested I went back to photography as soon as I could. <laughs> anyway, soon after that, I got the big break on Sons and Lovers. What is it? The mine. I thought Sun Lovers did a marvelous job, marvelous job, and uh, some of them don't make the transition very well, do they? But he did. Local people, many of them from mining families, became actors to help recreate a mining disaster. Jack Cardiff was the director. I do think that, that cinematographers are inclined to be suspected of concentrating on the look of the picture, which I, I don't think Jack did, and I think that he was very clever to, uh, to, to want to work with Freddie Francis, who was a very est uh, established cameraman at that, at, at that time. I'd just done a film for, for Jack Clayton, a room called Room at the Top, and I, I guess Jack liked the look of that and decided he'd like me to do his film. Either that or he thought I was cheap, I can't remember. I would never go to Freddie and say, hey, Freddie, do you think the back like a bit hot? Or, you know, whatever, I would never say anything. It's a beautifully lit uh, and beautifully directed black and white film. In fact, it's one of the classics of British black and white cinematography of the, the post-war period. Forgive me. Forgive you? I love you. I always thought, being a southerner, I always thought that going up north it was dreary and dark like that, so I was quite happy to, to shoot it that way. Action. And the local actors jump to it, producing a scene which will be one of the highlights of the film. And you found yourself nominated for Best Direction at the American Academy Awards alongside Alfred Hitchcock, who'd done Psycho that year. Because I'd worked with him, as you know. And, uh, and he'd seen Sons and Lovers. He said, I've, I've seen Sons and Lovers. He said, it was bloody good. He looked at me and I say, how could you make, how could you make such a good film? Because I was, to him, I was a cameraman, you know. It had a tremendous reception, and I felt this was really something, that the, the lights were coming on and everyone was applauding. And Buddy Adler, who was the, the chief of uh, 20th Century Fox, 
whispered in my ear. He said, Jack, you must enjoy every moment of this. It may never happen to you again. In fact, it never happened quite as good as that. Did you ever see Son Sons and Lovers that Jack directed? Oh, of course. That's yeah. a beautiful film. Beautiful film. I have a print of it. Right. A scope print of it. And uh, I like a lot um, uh, Sons and Lovers. Um, Young Cassidy I like a great deal. I have a print of that also. <laughs> Was it hard for you to go back to cinematography after the kind of heights of... Not Sons really. I've always loved photography anyway, and I've, th that was a time after that, some years after that, that uh, I made about a dozen films in all, and then the film business in England, as you know, more or less collapsed. There was no work at all. Uh, I think it was, must have been, uh, a very wrenching, angst-ridden decision. Uh, and I really felt for him when he, when he had to do it in one way. In the other way, I was very happy because I grabbed him immediately to be the cinematographer on the next picture that I made. Your Majesty, I'm not the Prince of Wales. <laughs> There are good cameramen and fast cameramen. There are very few good and fast, and Jack was one of them. That one's the red shoes, and that's Rambo. And I think most people are very surprised that a CV could incorporate the red shoes in the late 40s and Rambo yes. in the 80s. Oh, I had a lot of fun on the Rambo picture. See you are no stranger to pain. Perhaps you have been among my Vietnamese comrades before. Hmm? A totally different ball game then, because with Sylvester Stallone, he was um, very masculine, very tough, and, and the, 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 the film that I made with him was a toughie, and uh, couldn't try anything sort of beautiful composition or anything. It was really tough. Everything was tough. But it was successful. <laughs> Jack was the same dedicated, brilliant uh, creator that he always was. He didn't change in all that time, and he put the same amount of enthusiasm and extreme professionalism into the last film we made as he did in the very first. The only other cameraman I work with who is that fast and that good is Sven Nyqvist. Sven is lightning fast, and so is Jack. He had this box of filters, and he always carried it with him. And we were up in North Mexico in the desert, and, and the sky was really bad. It was like all gray, and there was nothing there. So he pulled out a little thing and started painting, and he put it in the camera, and all of a sudden, instead of being a gray sky, it made it magical, you know? He's just a genius. <laughs> Today, uh, there's a big difference. I mean, the days when I was working, like on pictures, like on Red Shoes, with all these effects, and, and any film which had a lot of effects, I wanted very much to do it myself. Even if it meant, like I said before, breathing on the lens to have a fade in through mist or whatever. But nowadays, um, anything that comes up, uh, like a shot is going to be made, which is really fantastic. They said, Jack, don't worry about that. Special effects will do that. So I always felt a bit uh, left left in the lurch. Digital imagery looks real, but it lacks an authenticity. It lacks the used feeling in a way. Uh, it lacks the feeling that you're really there. And then the attack. But 
what I'm saying now won't matter at all because uh, it's already gone. It's all finished. Today, this scene you see being filmed has been processed in Technicolor. Cinematography is definitely an art form, and it is, I think, the main art of the 20th century. There's no question that it is, because it involves every element of art plus one, which is movement. Well, I would like to, I would like to think it's an art form, you know, but um, there's always the stigma of cinema because it's populist. Um, those who are, you know, uh, you know, wonderful literary figures, critics, etc., intellectuals, will feel that uh, cinema is a popular art form. Therefore, it's not a popular form. Therefore, it's not really art. When I see him, I see the young eyes of a child peering. It, it reminds me of the eyes of Chagall, the painter. Uh, very inquisitive. How do you get a, uh, uh, almost like a spiritual image in your mind and try to make that concrete? An idea that hits you here, an image that hits you here, and then you have to translate it through this piece of equipment. Some people, in an effort to be kind and complimentary, they say, ah, oh, Jack, they don't make films like those old Technicolor films, you know, but of course that's all nonsense. I mean, the, the, to me, the standard of photography uh, has improved you know, enormously. Go on, keep going. Keep going. Chris, why, why don't you want to retire? No, I think it's... Uh, I'd, I'd hate the idea. I've got, I've got a, a big horizon. I mean, there's painting in between, which is nice and, to do. And, uh, Hopefully, one of these days, I'll just drop dead on the film set. <laughs> this is the first time an honorary Oscar has been given to a cinematographer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my special privilege to present to you Mr. Jack Carter. Thank you.